is a single item, a resolution arising under the Congressional Review Act to disapprove the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives rule that forces millions of law abiding gun owners, many of them disabled veterans, to dispose of or register their firearms with stabilizing braces. Stabilizing pistol braces were designed to help disabled veterans shoot firearms that they would otherwise be unable to hold, stabilize, or aim. In 2012, the Obama-era ATF recognized that these devices serve a legitimate function and determined that they should therefore not be subject to onerous regulation. The Biden administration's reverse uh, over a decade of precedent and usurped Congress's legislative power in subjecting stabilizing braces to regulation under the National Firearms Act. Owners, many of whom are disabled veterans, must destroy the braces or their weapons, hand them over to the ATF, or submit to a lengthy and expensive registration process with no certainty of success. It's clear from uh, this latest action that the Biden administration is intent on eroding the Second Amendment and constitutionally protected rights of law-abiding Americans. I strongly believe the government should protect rather than restrict our rights under the Second Amendment. We should be supporting freedom and personal responsibility, and the House should ensure that our constitutional rights are protected, all of them. That is why I'm proud to have joined uh, every member of the Oklahoma delegation in co-sponsoring H.J. Res. 44. Indeed, my constituents in southwest Oklahoma expect nothing less. I urge all members of the House to join in supporting this resolution, ensuring that the Second Amendment rights of responsible gun owners are protected. I now yield to my good friend, our ranking member, Mr. McGovern, for any remarks he wishes to make. Well, thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. Um, you know, for five months, uh, Kevin McCarthy and House Republicans have given America nothing but chaos. And Congress opened with Republicans wasting nearly a week because they couldn't pick a speaker. Fifteen votes, almost five entire days. And during that time, Kevin McCarthy was making secret deals to secure power. Come to find out, he made some shady backroom agreements that weren't even written down on paper. We still don't know exactly what was agreed to in those meetings, but now we have a little bit of an idea. He was promising to push through extremist, unpopular, radical bills that were demanded by the most extreme, fringe members of the Republican conference. So here we are, five months later, and what have Republicans accomplished? They've enacted five laws. By the way, for comparison, when Democrats were in charge and Donald Trump, of all people, was president, we had enacted 21 laws. And Kevin McCarthy gave away the game last week. He said the debt ceiling bill is their biggest accomplishment to date. Let me repeat that. Their biggest achievement so far is ending a crisis that they created. What an achievement. Holding the economy hostage to jam through unpopular ideas that can't pass through regular order. And because of Democratic help and Democratic votes, President Biden prevented a default, and Democrats helped get the job done. And you would think that maybe after all of that, there would have been some come to Jesus moment in the Speaker's office. But there wasn't, because we are back to paralysis on the House floor. The first failed rule vote in over 20 years because the MAGA fringe that first hijacked the Republican Party has now decided to stage a revolt. Let me just say up front, this has nothing to do with my good friend, the chairman of this committee, uh, Mr. Cole, who I believe maintains the tradition of decency and decorum uh, in this hearing room and on the House floor. But it's about the dysfunction of the Republican conference under the failed leadership of this speaker. And so the People's House is frozen in limbo until Republicans can decide where their loyalty lies, with the American people who sent us here or with the far right that is holding them over a barrel and demanding, not asking, demanding that we, that, that we do what they say. And let me be clear. I don't support the bills the, Re the Republican leadership is trying to bring to the floor, but this is a dangerous precedent, and it's an embarrassment to the House. My friends say, my friends, this is not democracy. This is not how this country should work, and this is certainly no way to govern this country. Now on to today's business. We are meeting to advance a dangerous bill to make firearm stabilizing braces widely available. Nine people outside a bar in Dayton in 2019. Ten people, including a police officer at a grocery store in Boulder in 2021. Five people in an LGBTQ nightclub 
in Colorado Springs in 2022. Six people, including children, at a school in Nashville just a few months ago, all killed by mass shooters with the help of stabilizing braces. And today, my Republican friends want to roll back regulations on stabilizing braces. They want to keep in place a loophole that makes it easier for people to make guns more dangerous. I'm disgusted. Our constituents are being slaughtered. You'll see I'm wearing an orange ribbon today because June is Gun Violence Awareness Month. And instead of trying to stop mass shootings, instead of working to protect Americans from gun violence, this committee now is advancing a bill that would make it easier for the next mass shooter to kill people. I mean, give me a break. And the craziest thing is this rule was inspired by guidance published under the Trump administration. Let me repeat that. The ATF under the Trump administration thought this was necessary and appropriate. And my Republican colleagues are so extreme and so obsessed and so afraid of the NRA that they are overturning common sense gun safety regulations that were originally uh, uh, developed under Trump. And just to be clear, the ATF rule they are trying to overturn does not even ban stabilizing braces. It simply properly regulates them. I get it. The bill's author owns a gun shop and makes millions from selling guns and gun accessories, including stabilizing braces. Sure sounds like a conflict of interest to me, but we are considering it because Speaker McCarthy is trying to put down a far-right rebellion. So we will vote on a bill to make it easier to kill people. He has given away everything to a small group of radical Republicans who will continue to demand more and more from him, apparently now including letting them dictate exactly what bills come to the floor. I'll just close by asking, where are the moderate Republicans um, uh, in this House? Are there any of them left? And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Without objection, any prepared statements that our witnesses may have will be included in the record. I'd like to welcome our first panel, Representative Ben Klein and the ranking member Jerry Nadler from the Committee on the Judiciary. Representative Klein, welcome to the Rules Committee, a place you've been many times, uh, and I welcome your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member McGovern, members of the committee. I apologize in advance for my voice when you have small children in league sports. You tend from time to time to go a little hoarse. Uh, the Congressional Review Act requires agencies to submit a rule to Congress before the rule can take effect. After submission of a rule by the agency, Congress has the ability to introduce and pass a joint resolution of disapproval. The measure before us today does just that. H.J. Res. 44 provides for congressional disapproval of the rule submitted by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives related to factoring criteria for firearms with attached stabilizing braces. On January 31, 2023, the ATF issued a final rule titled Factoring Criteria for Firearms with Attached Stabilizing Braces that effectively bans pistol stabilizing braces nationwide. That rule redefined a firearm with an attached stabilizing brace as a short-barreled rifle su subject to regulation under the Gun Control Act of 1968 and the National Firearms Act of 1934. The rule directly contradicted a prior 2012 determination made during the Obama administration on which law-abiding firearm owners relied for a decade that a firearm equipped with a stabilizing brace would not be subject to National Firearms Act controls. And for more than a decade, the ATF told manufacturers and consumers that the braces were perfectly legal. Now, it's done a complete about face. The rule requires the owners of the roughly 40 million firearms with stabilizing braces in circulation to obtain a special registration, surrender or destroy their brace, or face severe criminal penalties as a result of this regulatory change. This change didn't occur because of a law that Congress passed or a ruling from a judge Rather, it's the decision from an, from an unnamed and electorally unaccountable bureaucrat to turn law-abiding Americans into felons with a stroke of a pen. As the duly elected representatives of our constituents, we cannot sit idly by and allow executive branch bureaucrats to make law that impacts millions of Americans. This rule usurps the legislative power of this body, and this rule should offend every member of this body. To be clear, this resolution is not about gun violence or about gun control. This resolution is about who makes the laws under our system of government. The pistol brace rule exceeds the <coughs> ATF's statutory authority. <coughs> Congress has neither criminalized the use of pistol braces under the GCA nor authorized their regulation under the NFA. This resolution is nothing more than Congress 
reclaiming our Article I constitutional responsibility to make the laws. Thank you, Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, Ranking Member Nadler, it's great to have you here, and uh, you're recognized for your opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Chairman Cole, Ranking Mem Member McGovern, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today about H.J. Res. 144. Uh, this bill would ignore the considered judgment of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives and make stabilizing braces a favorite tool of mass shooters widely available without a background check. Today's hearing is one of those clarifying moments when the priorities of the Republican majority are on clear display. Instead of taking up legislation to reduce gun violence in America, we are here discussing a bill to ensure that more deadly weapons are in the hands of mass shooters in this country. What a disgrace. Mr. Chairman, gun violence continues to take the lives of more than 100 Americans every single day. It changes how safe we feel in our schools and in our houses of worship. It reduces vibrant cities to somber headlines. It takes our loved ones, old and young, and leaves us with another anniversary of lives cut short and a community forever changed. Today, rather than stand up against gun violence, the majority plans to pass this bill so that they can yet again stand with the gun industry. Rather than support the law enforcement officers who are on the front lines of protecting our communities, the majority is attempting to weaken law enforcement by rolling back a rule created by the ATF meant to protect us from dangerous weapons. ATF is the law enforcement agency tasked with keeping guns out of the wrong hands and keeping our gun laws in line with congressional intent through rulemaking. In 1934, Congress passed the National Firearms Act, creating additional requirements to own certain especially dangerous firearms, like short-barreled rifles, which were widely used by violent criminals. Congress included short-barreled rifles because they combined the firepower of a rifle with the concealability of a smaller gun. But in recent years, the gun industry discovered a way to circumvent the restrictions of the National Firearms Act by selling stabilizing braces, an accessory that allows a pistol to be fired from the shoulder, turning it in, into a deadly yet concealable short-barreled rifle. In 2020, under the Trump administration, the ATF concluded the stabilizing braces were being widely used to create short-barreled rifles, and it published guidance regarding their use. But House Republicans cried foul. Just four days after the guidance was published, 90 House Republicans sent a letter to ATF and DOJ expressing their opposition, and just a few days later, the guidance was withdrawn. A few months later, under the Biden administration, the ATF revived its efforts to regulate stabilizing braces, and it published the final rule in January to ensure that our laws stay in line with the intent of Congress, dating all the way back to 1934, when Congress decided that deadly concealable short-barreled rifles should be subject to heightened regulation. But Republicans will stop at nothing to block the ATF from taking this simple life-saving measure, even though they know that blocking this rule could have deadly consequences. Mass shooters used guns with stabilizing braces to kill nine people outside a bar in Dayton in 2019, to kill 10 people, including a responding police officer at a grocery store in Boulder in 2021, to kill five people in an LGBTQ nightclub in Colorado Springs again last year, and just this past March, to kill six people, including three children, at a school in Nashville, the 19th school shooting this year. The Nashville shooting occurred the day before the Judiciary Committee initially planned to mark up this resolution. So the majority, apparently sensitive to the optics, if not the substance, of marking up this resolution postponed the markup. But three weeks later, they decided that enough time had passed since three more families woke up without the child they had taken to school, and that they were ready to advance a bill to enable more mass shooters to inflict death and destruction in our communities. I guess they thought that we had forgotten the lives lost in that terrible tragedy. But we will never forget them, or the countless others who lose their lives to gun violence every day. Now today, the majority seeks to advance this bill to the House floor, even though several members of their own party have expressed discomfort with the bill. But with the Speaker held hostage by a few of his most extreme members and the floor at a complete standstill, a deal was struck, and here we are on the cusp of a vote by the full House. How many more lives will be lost because Republicans refuse to acknowledge that these weapons are a favorite of mass shooters for their ability to make a gun both deadly and concealable? 
How many more people have to die before Republicans will value the lives of our children over the profits of the gun industry? Last Congress, Democrats put forth a range of solutions to prevent gun violence, to support law enforcement, and to solve violent crimes. But our colleagues across the aisle continue to push for unfettered access to every firearm and accessory imaginable. As Republicans continue to seek freedom from gun regulation, we will continue to see communities free from gun violence. I urge my colleagues to oppose this dangerous legislation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank both of you for your testimony. The chair has no questions, but before I move to my good friend, the vice chair, having left you hanging last week, I need to report that the University of Oklahoma women's softball team did indeed sweep the finals, being a really great FSU team, Florida State University team, uh, 5-0 to zero and 3-1. to one extending their unprecedented winning streak to 53 straight games. That was their third national title in a row. That's only happened one other time in the history of women's uh, college softball. And their sixth title in 10 years. So I uh, just wanted to note that for the record. And with that, uh, they, uh, the congratulations goes to those extraordinary women. They are an amazing and, and a really fantastic coach who's won now seven national titles uh, with a series of great players. So with that, I turn to my friend, uh, distinguished vice chair of the committee, Mr. Bur Dr. Burgess, for any questions he may have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and congratulations to the state of Oklahoma on that. Um, I do want to take issue with one of the things that the ranking member brought up. He said that President Biden had prevented a default by signing a bill. Wait a minute. President Biden pushed a default on the American people by not speaking to our speaker, leaders in the Senate, for months until the House actually passed a bill, the Limit, Save, and Grow Act. Otherwise, I submit that the President would have been happy to see us go past the X date and allow his Secretary of the Treasury, who's already graphically demonstrated her incompetence time and again, but then allow her to decide what bills get paid and what bills do not. Some of us on this side felt that that was not a good trajectory, and so the bill was passed that, that eliminated the debt limit, at least for a time. But honestly, to say that President Biden prevented a default is, is revisionist history at its absolute worst. Mr. Klein, let me just ask you, if, uh, if nothing happens, when does this rule begin to affect your constituents and my constituents? I would answer, gentlemen, that uh, this rule would go into effect uh, very soon, but uh, there is a grace period. It is a, a short grace period, but uh, within uh, the year, millions of Americans would be made felons. So the people who are calling our offices concerned that something is not done to stop this rule, they will become, by by executive fiat or by, by virtue of what the agency has done, they will be on the wrong side of the law. That's correct. Um, <clears throat> there is a reason we have a legislative branch, and, and I thank you for reminding us that uh, the legislative branch is, in fact, an important partner in our, our division of powers in this country. Uh, more power given to the administration, to the agencies, is not moving us in the proper direction, that we're in the people's house for a reason. We need to do the people's business. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Thank you very much. Distinguished ranking members, recognized for any questions well, he might Well, thank you. Well, let me just begin by saying I stand by everything I said in my opening statement. Um, uh, when Donald Trump was president, we, uh, we passed the increase in the debt ceiling three times uh, because President Trump and all of my Republican friends said you shouldn't politicize the debt ceiling. They changed their tune when Trump lost, um, and they lost. Uh, and the bottom line is that uh, politicizing the debt ceiling uh, was a rotten thing to do, a terrible thing to do, a dangerous thing to do, an awful precedent. Uh, and, um, and so, uh, and, and again, you, uh, things in th that were in that debt ceiling uh, package that uh, would probably ne never be able to pass regular order. But I mean, to President Biden's credit, 
uh, he put the country first and delivered a lot of Democratic votes uh, that my Republican friends were, were not up to being delivered their own caucus, and now we're in this paralysis because I, you're fighting with yourself and lots of luck with that. Uh, secondly, I have a lot of gun owners in my district, too. Um, and uh, they're happy to comply with reasonable re regulation because they are sick and tired of children being slaughtered in this country. I mean, every single day there's another massacre. And nobody seems to give a damn uh, on the other side of the aisle. And I think people have had it. People have had it. Mr. Nadler, to listen to my colleagues speak, you would think that the rule that they're trying to overturn uh, would ban stabilizing braces outright, does it? No. Um, I mean, and that's the thing. Uh, I mean, no amount of oversight, responsible oversight or regulation um, can be tolerated because the NRA basically says no. They call the shots here. You want our money? You got to vote the way we want you to vote. Mr. Chairman. Yes. The United States, we keep hearing that the problem of gun violence, the reason we have so many murders by guns is because of mental health. That's what our Republican colleagues keep telling us. The United States is the only country in the world where we have these mass shootings day after day, week after week. It is a slander on the American people to say that our people are 75 times as mentally ill as those in Canada or England or Germany or any other country. You know, um, it's really kind of ironic, uh, especially after the gentleman from Texas's comments about the debt ceiling and uh, and all the you know the controversy generated by some of the extreme members of the Republican conference over you know the the debt and all, and the deficit. We have to you know make sure that we're not spending any more money. I'm looking at a CBO cost estimate for this bill. Have you seen it, Mr. Nella? Yeah, you, uh, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, there's a cost to this bill, and the cost is over $500 million. And so they're fine with adding another $500 million to the deficit, you know, but then they go after food aid for poor people. I mean, it's like, what the hell is going on here? You know, where are their priorities? I, mean, I have to tell you, you know, I, I, I've, been, I've, been, I've been studying up town hall meetings again in my district, and you know, people, a lot of people who don't even agree with me, on, probably never even vote for me, come to these meetings and they talk about the epidemic of gun violence, uh, that they're afraid for the kids to go to a movie, or go to a baseball game, or go to the theater, or go to, you know, to any event where there are lots of people present. Uh, and on top of that, in the aftermath of Donald Trump's recent indictment, you hear some of his supporters saying some of the most incendiary things, even invoking the fact that a lot of his supporters are members of the NRA. I guess we all know what that person is trying to, to get to. I mean, you know, with all that's going on in this country, people are worried. It's not just Democrats. It's not just people who live in urban areas. It's people who live in suburban areas and live in rural areas. And what really bothers them is that in the aftermath of massacres, they don't get the sense that there's any outrage by the people who are pushing things like this. And again, I, I, I just point out again for the record, the guy who is the author of this bill, I think has a conflict of interest. I mean, he, he sells these things. Uh, and he's the one who's pushing it. So, you know, I mean, I, I don't I, This place is, um, is all screwed up, uh, in my opinion, right now. They have the votes to get this to the floor. I don't know whether they have the votes to, to, to pass it. I, I hope not. But at some point, enough has to be enough. I thank you both for being here. I yield back my time. The gentlelady from Minnesota is recognized for any questions she may have for the panel. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just want to say that this points out the reason that we have the RAINS Act. <laughs> um, because this is no way, rule writing is no way to govern. And uh, I know that in 117th, there was a bill um, in then uh, Chair Nadler's uh, um, um, committee that would have done the same thing, um, that would have banned these uh, stabilizing braces and never taken up by the Senate. 
And so now we're trying to do it by rule. And so I appreciate. Um, Excuse me, John Lady, because you, you just said that they ban, this rule bans uh, these accessories. I think I just had a question. Well, me, well I, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, thank I'm you. I'm sorry. Um, but the bill last year that was in the judiciary did ban. It was an attempt to ban. So, <laughs> whatever that, the case that, that is, is, this is, I'm sorry, it's my time, I'm going to finish. Um, it, you know, what um, it makes, it just Thanks. makes it so important that we do the RAINS Act, that we look at these things, because what this will only accomplish is to make our disabled hunters who use these, our disabled veteran hunters who use these criminals. And um, I just want to say that I fully support this and uh, making sure that we can, um, we can legislate instead of having the rule writers legislate. So I appreciate that, and I yield back. Thank you. General lady from Pennsylvania is recognized for any questions she may have for the panel. Thank you. You know, almost every day we are horrified by another mass shooting. Just in the past few weeks, we've seen tragedies at a high school graduation in Richmond, Virginia, on a beach in Hollywood, Florida, and at a mall in Allen, Texas. So what's the response? The Republican majority is trying to make it easier for mass shooters to obtain and conceal deadly firearms. That's what this regulation addresses. The regulation at issue today concerns stabilizing braces, a device that can be used to circumvent the National Firearms Act, in which Congress specifically found that certain types of firearms were weapons of war and had no appropriate sporting use or use for personal protection. This is from what Congress passed. As a result, Congress determined that certain types of weapons were, quote, especially dangerous to the community, end quote, and must be, quote, regulated since they're used for violence and criminal activity. So while, yes, it's true that these stabilizing braces were originally developed to assist persons with disabilities, over time they've been adapted and marketed as a way to get around the congressional determination in the National Firearms Act, that determination that deadly short-barreled rifles must be subject to extra regulation. And that's what we've seen, the increasing use of these braces as the weapon of choice for mass murderers, whether to kill nine people outside of a Dayton bar in 2019, another 10 people, including a responding police officer at a grocery store in Boulder, Colorado in 2021, another five people at an LGBTQ um, nightclub in Colorado Springs last year, and just in March of this year, it was reported that the shooter at the Nashville Elementary School, where three nine-year-olds and three teachers were killed, had one of these devices. So it's important to understand what the purpose of the regulation is and to recognize the gross misrepresentations about what it actually does. The rule does not prevent veterans with disabilities from using, using stabilizing arm braces as they were originally designed and intended. It also does not prohibit the sale of braces, nor does it punish or penalize anyone who currently owns a stabilizing brace. The rule itself lists, I can't remember now, four or five different ways in which current owners of these braces can be in compliance with the regulation, including simply registering the devices or detaching the stabilizing brace from a firearm. So I'm quoting directly from the rule here. Nothing in this rule bans stabilizing braces or the use of stabilizing braces on pistols. However, firearms with an attached brace device may be subject to statutory and regulatory requirements. So this rule isn't an attack on gun owners. It doesn't ban the sale of the brace. It doesn't penalize any current brace owners. It's obvious to sensible Americans that improved regulations are needed to make sure that people aren't evading congressional intent, that short-barreled rifles, rifles are inherently dangerous and need extra regulation. The Second Amendment is not a suicide pact. The American people know that. They're demanding that we stop wasting time with these nonsense measures and pass legislation that saves lives rather than endangering it. So, um, Chairman Nadler, was there anything else you wanted to add with respect to whether or not current owners 
of these braces are instantly made felons, as some of our colleagues well, have suggested. Well, they're clearly not instantly made felons because uh, of all the things that you just said. Uh, they simply have to register their uh, uh, stabilizing braces uh, by a certain date. Um, they can replace the short barrel with the barrel 16 inches or longer. They can remove the brace. They can register the firearm as set forth by the National Firearms Act. And uh, period. They can do any of those things um, after the effective date of the bill. After, they can do any of those things, rather. Well, and, and we've addressed this regulation a couple times recently in the Judiciary Committee. And what was really um, enlightening was seeing how these things are being marketed. Because although we hear this rhetoric about, oh, it's for veterans who've been disabled, um, what you see when you look at the marketing materials are sellers of these things literally winking at a camera and saying, oh, yeah, you can use this, you know, to, to get around something when they are showing them, they're demonstrating them as being a way to turn a pistol into a short-barreled rifle. So um, it's about, as usual with the NRA and with the gun manufacturers, it's about making bank off other people's misery. It, it is indeed. And... Uh comment on what the uh, ranking member of the stated. Um, uh, there is a conflict of interest to Mr. Clyde, who is the sponsor of this resolution, owns a gun store, gun store and sells these braces. Clear conflict of interest. Well, and the regulation does provide a way for people who sell these braces to do so legally if yes. they register them appropriately, yes. right? Indeed. But just too much trouble when it might get in the way of someone committing another mass murder. OK, thank you. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Kentucky is recognized for any questions he may have for the panel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ranking Member, Member Nadler, are you aware of the November 26, 2012 letter from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives to the inventor of the stabilizing brace, Mr. Bosco? No, I'm not. Okay. Uh, on November 26, 2012, Mr. Bosco uh, received correspondence from the ATF telling him that these were legal. And I'll just read two sentences from this uh, letter, which I will submit for the record. I'll go ahead and ask unanimous consent. Without objection. They tell Mr. Bosco, you are asking if the addition of this sample buffer tube forearm brace would convert a firearm in a manner that would cause it to be classified as a rifle and thus a firearm regulated by the National Firearms Act. I'll skip some of this. Based on our evaluation, FTB, that's the Firearms Technology Branch of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and Explosives, FTB finds that the submitted forearm brace, when attached to a firearm, does not convert that weapon to be fired from the shoulder and would not alter the classification of a pistol or other firearm. Mr. Bosco received this letter from the ATF, and he based an entire business on it. Millions of gun owners based their purchase of these braces on this letter from the ATF. Do you, uh, do you disagree with this letter that the ATF, uh, when uh, President Obama was president, that the ATF sent to Mr. Bosco? That well, I, I can't comment on the 2012 letter, which I know nothing about, but... The fact of the matter is uh, the braces have changed over time. The ATF determined that gun owners were using a loophole. And uh, so it's a different brace today than at the time in, uh, that that letter was written. And as I stated before, current owners of stabilizing braces can comply with the rule in the manners that I stated before. Let me, let me uh, uh, dispute something that you've said, you said that the brace is different today. Does that mean if Mr. Bosco makes the exact identical brace that he sent to the ATF, he should be allowed to do that? The brace uh, from 2012? I yeah. Would, I would think so. I would but think obviously so, obviously the braces are not the same today. But if he, but I'm glad you agree that if the ATF told him it was legal, that he should still be able to make these. If, as long as he adhered to the very same brace that he sent the ATF. In 2012. So um, he's given me, I would have brought it, but we're not allowed 
props in the rules committee, um, but he's given me this brace, the very same brace that he submitted. Uh, it was based on that prototype. And he's, he's wondering why he can't make these anymore. And this just gets to the point well, that, that offends so many Americans that the ATF said it was legal, and here we are a decade later, 40 million gun owners later, and the ATF now says it's illegal. No, and this there's is, a difference. The, bra the first brace that Mr. Bosco submitted was a forearm brace that he never brought to market. There's no change in the law for firearms with stabilizing braces that are not, quote, designed, made, and intended to be fired from the shoulder. A forearm with a, a firearm, I should say, with a stabilizing brace that's designed, made, and intended to be fired from the forearm, with, with, which uh, was Mr. Bosco's uh, design back in 2012, is not subject to the NFA as a result of the rule. It's braces that um, are designed uh, to be fired from the shoulder, that, that are designed to enable the, sh uh, the, the pistol to be fired from the shoulder. Well, it's... It's not different. Um, there are different, cosmetically different versions of it, but it functions exactly the it, same. It, it, there's fundamental and this is difference. what the fundamental difference is: either if the brace is, is designed in such a way as a, to uh, uh, be a forearm brace, that's okay. But it's designed in such a way as to enable a, a, a short barrel pistol to be sold from. The, I'm sorry, to be fired from the shoulder, then that's subject to the rule. Now, now you get into another legal distinction about how it's designed and how it's used. And the law does talk about if it's designed a certain way, and Mr. Bosco designed it not to be fired from the shoulder. And so you're applying two standards here. No. Was it designed Mr. to be fired from the shoulder, or did the consumers who bought it then fire it from the shoulder? You can't use both uh, legal regimes to regulate this, but I am glad, let me just ask you again, if the ATF told him something was legal 10 years ago, should he still be, should he be able to make that? Yes, but Would the gentleman remember you that the forearm, uh, the forearm br brace is what was held to be legal by the ATF. The shoulder brace is what the ATF <laughs> has objected to and what uh, we're talking about today. And the ATF, exactly, after all, is the experts we deferred to on the, their judgment on these matters, generally. This, um, I mean, there, there are pictures. Here's a patent picture. It's a, it's a handgun brace. It's a forearm brace. It's not a, a shoulder stock. Well, okay. And, and this, is, this is from six years ago the, when the, uh, the patent was issued uh, or, or filed. So... You're trying to have it both ways. You're talking about, is it designed a certain way? Uh, was it the intent for it to be fired from the shoulder? But now you're implicating it because you say people use it for th things it wasn't intended for. Let me get to an important point. This is so critical. You're saying they're not banned. That is, that's just not correct. The, in 13 states, you can't own a short-barreled rifle. So the ATF's directive that if you, if you don't want to destroy it uh, or that you can register it as a short barrel rifle does not hold true in 13 states, does not hold true for 36%. But that's a state law. It's not a matter of federal regulation. That's a state law, as you just said. So you, but it was legal in that state until the ATF came up with this rule, and now you have, by using the state laws, banned these in 13 states, where 36% of the U.S. population resides. Mr. Massey, states are permitted to ban things that the federal government doesn't. Happens all the time. Okay, but it's a de facto ban because you're relying, the state is relying on the federal definition, and you've changed the definition after 10 years of precedent, after written correspondence from the ATF, You've changed it, so you can't say that people can keep these if they want to just by merely registering them with the federal government because, as, as you're saying, the state law overrides no, the federal law. No states, you cannot. You cannot, okay. In well, those states. Thank you for because, acknowledging because the, 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 that this is a ban in 13 states. But this, we're not talking, 
not this bill, not, I'm sorry, not this uh, uh, rule that, that, that this bill would seek to overturn. They're, they're, the, the states, uh, by, by law or by state regulation, can ban things that the federal government doesn't. But on May 30th, they weren't banned in these states, and these state laws didn't ban these stabilizing braces. And on June 1st, they are banned in 13 states. What's so hard to understand? This is a ban. This is a de facto ban. Let me, let me move on to something else. Mr. Nadler, ben Ranking Jewish. Member Nadler, uh, do you know what the punishment is for somebody now who's in violation of this rule? No. What the conviction would result in? No, I do not. What would be a fair uh, prison term for owning a piece of plastic? I, I, it's not, I'm not a judge. I'm not going to say what a fair uh, prison term would be. We would have to look at other comparable, uh, comparable crimes or, or comparable regulations and see what they're uh, prison terms are, or what their penalties are. With all due respect, you were chairman of the Judiciary Committee, yes. though, and um, there were some mandatory minimums that were established. Well, I always oppose mandatory minimums. We, we can agree on that. But this, uh, I think you might be shocked to know that millions of Americans are subject to, what, you want to take a guess how, how no. long they would serve for having this piece of plastic on a gun? Mr. Klein, do you want to comment? I thank the gentleman that's up, it's up to a $250 fine, $250,000 fine, and uh, up to 10 years in T federal prison. 10 years in prison. I, I would also point out that let me, let it's me. not the ownership of the accessory that triggers a penalty. It's the use without following the regulation. It's the possession. No, it is not the possession. Well, you're, if you possess one of these, it is the possession. It's not the use. And... Um, Mr. Mr. Klein is correct. I'll wait until you can pay attention. I know you're getting coached. Thank the gentleman. Uh, I was sorry, Mr. Klein. Wouldn't it's talk the, to you. It's the possession of the accessory that attaches to the gun that makes it a a short-barreled rifle. That is what is prohibited. So now you agree with me? It's possession, not no, use. No, it's the use. I'm sorry. I shouldn't say possession. It's the use of the brace with the short-barreled gun to make it a, a, an effect of uh, a rifle. I'm not a lawyer, and I've never been chairman of the Judiciary Committee, but I do know what possession is, and you don't have to use this brace if you merely possess it on, on, a, on a pistol that you are now a felon as of June 1st if you haven't registered this with the federal government or destroyed it. It's possession of a short-barreled rifle, not of the brace. And can we? And so you're agreeing it's not use. No, I'm not agreeing. If 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 you have the brace, and you do not attach it to a short-barreled rifle, that's fine. But if you attach it to a short, I, sh I shouldn't say a short-barreled rifle, a short-barreled gun. But if you attach it to a short-barreled gun, thus creating uh, uh, a banned weapon, that is prohibited. Just okay. like the possession of the machine gun is prohibited. Okay. Thanks. I'm glad we got the terms here now. Back to my question. Do you now know how long somebody can be convicted for? Mr. Klein told us. Yeah, do you remember what he said? I think he said five, uh, five years and $10,000. Ten years. Ten years for each infraction. If you own 30 of these, you could get 30 years. Or three of these, you could get 30 years. Does it seem a little extreme to get... 10 years in prison for owning a piece of plastic that the ATF Sorry. for 10 years maintained was legal? It, again, it is not for owning a p piece of plastic. If you follow the proper procedures and you don't convert uh, your, your um, um, pistol into a short-barreled rifle, which is prohibited, there's no crime. It's for owning a piece of plastic that you've owned for up to 10 years. It is years. not for ownership of the piece of plastic at all. You can own it for as long as you want. You can have as many such things as you want. It's use of it with a, sh with a, with a pistol to create a short-barreled rifle, which is what is prohibited. So are you saying if you merely detach the, the brace from the firearm, you're no longer violating the law? 
Yes. Okay, that's what okay. Mr. Dettelbach said too. But neither of you understand this rule because you will be convicted for this. It, the ATF slides, their documentation that accompanies this rule, it all says that you have to destroy the brace or make it otherwise unreattachable, that, that it can't be attached to the firearm. So you can't just, you can't have this thing laying around. In fact, Mr. Jordan and I were so surprised that Mr. Dettelbox thought the same thing you do, that all you got to do is separate these things. In fact, he, uh, can you find me his letter in this? I want to, or his, his statements from Mr. Dettelbach said that all you have to do is separate the two. But the ATF rule doesn't say that. But you're saying that, Mr. Dettelbach says that. And what's the problem with your testimony and Mr. Dettelbach's testimony is Americans are watching this. The, the deadline, by the way, was June 1st. And the only thing that keeps those people from becoming felons since June 1st, well, I hope they live in one of five districts where the federal courts have ruled against this thing already, this abomination. Mr. Klein. And I thank the gentleman for making that clarification that the grace period I spoke of that expired soon was ex exceptionally soon. It was, ten, it was 12 days ago. So I appreciate the gentleman for clarifying that. Uh, the one right before that. Anyways, I had his, I had his letter here somewhere. Um, let me ask you, Mr. Nadler, do you, are you... Let me, do you, let me ask you a question first. Let me first. read you from the ATF website. Okay, read us that. Other compliance options provided under the final rule are the following. Remove the, one, remove the short barrel and attach a 16-inch or longer rifled barrel to the firearm. Permanently remove and dispose of or alter the stabilizing brace such that it cannot be reattached. Return the firearm into your local ATF office or destroy the firearm. The, uh, the option to in addition to register. In, okay. and of course the option to register the okay. firearm tax free pursuant to ATF final rule 202R uh, 202TR 8F um, is scheduled is 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 is, is in effect. I'm, gl I'm glad you read that. So now do you understand why what you said before was inaccurate? That all you have to do is separate them. Or. Because here, let me, let me read you what Mr. Dettelbach, this is the director of the ATF, said about this rule. Detachment, that's not for us to regulate. If somebody simply, we wrote the rule to make it easy to comply with. If somebody just at their home detaches the weapon from the brace and keeps them apart, they do not have to register anything. They can keep the brace, they can keep the business end of the gun. Correct. That is incorrect. You just read me the rule, like, this is why we shouldn't be letting the administrative branch write laws, because the people who are supposed to be writing these laws, which is us, and the ATF director don't even understand the rule. And these have consequences, if somebody violates this, of 10 years in prison. And unless there, there's been a, a federal injunction, which there, there have been, but not for the entire country, you could go to prison for 10 years for having one of these on your pistol. On your pistol, yes. And for 10 years, that wasn't yes, the case. Yes, on, your, no, and they, and there's on no, your pistol, because that's what this seeks to, to, to stop. You can mm -hmm. have a brace, you can have a pistol, but you can't attach them to make it, in effect, a, 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 a rifle. Um, let me ask you something. Isn't it... Which has been prohibited since 1934. Do you, do you think you're going to stop any shootings by doing this? Yes. Which, can you, you think the, any of the mass public shootings or any of the shootings in the past, the, the shooter would have said, oh my gosh, it's illegal to have this thing on this thing, and I'm going to go do a shooting. All, we can, all, all you can say is that if this regulation is in effect and enforced, it will make it harder for people to have mass shootings because they, uh, because the weapons will be less uh, uh, repeatable. What do you mean by repeatable? Um, a repeat shooter. Um, I, I don't, that is to say, uh, semi-automatic in effect. The, um, this brace has nothing to do with whether the firearm is 
manual bolt or semi-automatic or fully it automatic. Makes a, 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 it makes the pistol, uh, uh, which is otherwise inaccurate. I mean, any pistol is inaccurate, but when you can fire it from the shoulder, it becomes much more accurate. So why wouldn't they just bring a rifle to the shooting or two pistols or more rounds? Let me ask you a question. Isn't it true that you would prefer to ban all AR-15s? Yes. And um, isn't it true that you would prefer to ban anything with a detachable magazine? I, I would prefer to, do, yes, to, to ban the magazine. Well, actually, to, to, to limit the magazine to 15 rounds. That was our legislation that we had last year. And you think keeping them at 15 rounds instead of 16 rounds makes the firearm Well, 15 safe. rounds instead of 100 rounds. I mean, you have to set the limit somewhere. Are you, are you aware that you can just carry more magazines? Yeah, but it takes time to reload. And it gives law enforcement an opportunity uh, uh, to, to I'm shoot sorry, you while you're reloading. Why didn't, um, did you pass a bill out of your committee to ban all AR-15s? Yes, we did. Why, uh, were you here in 1994 when the so-called yes, assault was. weapons ban was passed? Yes, I was. That was my first time. Do you think that, uh, that was helpful? Indeed, it was until, unfortunately, it wasn't uh, uh, renewed in 2004. Do, do you know that between during the period of time, can you explain how it helped? Because because here's what you need to know: uh, in that period of time between '94 and 2004, the number of so-called assault weapons more than doubled in the United States. Because the ban that you passed in 1994 was on the cosmetic features. And much like this rule from the ATF is on a cosmetic feature. So it, although it would have made criminals out of people who tried to sell something that looked cosmetically similar to what you banned in 1994, gun manufacturers just made AR, they just kept making AR-15s and uh, AK-47 style weapons with different cosmetics. And so if you think it worked, I'd like to know how you think it worked because the number of so-called assault weapons just ballooned from 94 I, to 2004. I, I do not think that is the case, and I think you'll find the statistics are that the number of mass shootings went down from two, 1994 until 2004 and sharply increased after 2004. So if they went down and the number of so-called assault weapons doubled during that period of time. I don't think that's true. But it is true. So let me ask you this. Why didn't uh, Majority Leader Schumer bring up your gun legislation if this was such because, a priority for your party? Because he didn't have the votes to, to, to overcome the filibuster, like a lot of our legislation. Take 60 votes in the Senate, Democrats didn't have 60 votes. But it wasn't worth voting on? I can't answer that. I don't know the Senate schedule. But he knew he didn't have the votes. Did all the Democrats support it in as the far Senate? As far I know. I, I heard there were some uh, Democrat senators who thought that your legislation went too far. I, 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 can't test, I can't speak to that. I didn't speak to all the Democratic senators. Let me just summarize here. You're the former chairman of judiciary, the, still the ranking member. I, re, I respect you to serve with you there on that committee. But I'm surprised to know that you didn't realize people would get 10 years in prison for doing something after June 1st that they had done for 10 years prior that was authorized by the ATF for 10 years. Um, I am concerned uh, that these people can be prosecuted now as felons with, as Mr. Klein said, extreme uh, monetary penalties and 10 years in prison for, and a lot of these people don't even know that they're in violation of the law. The other thing I was surprised about is your interpretation and Mr. Dettelbach's interpretation of the rule is wrong. And if people were to follow his advice, which you repeated, which is to merely separate the two, they're still felons subject to 10 years in prison. But the good news is there are multiple federal court injunctions against this rule already. It's, it's, and, and I think what's going to sink it is the fact that the, the evidence that the ATF themselves for 10 years believed that, the, that attaching this accessory 
to your pistol did not make it As a I rifle. said before, you were talking about apples and oranges. That was a forearm brace, not the shoulder brace. And uh, Mr. Bosco is going to be uh, pleasantly surprised that he can continue to manufacture the, the firearm, except that he's not because you're wrong on that too. This, this will ban, in fact, the very sample that he sent to the ATF that the letter was based on. That sample itself will get you 10 years in prison now that this rule is in effect. What the, what the American people, whether they own one of these braces or not, I do not own one, I have some AR-15s, I do not own one of these braces. What they're offended by, whether they even own a gun or not, is this notion that you could be doing something legal. You could get the government's permission you could get the government's authority to say that what you're doing is legal. And then one day you wake up and you're a felon. It's not correct. That is, that is what's offensive. That's uh, to my colleague before me. That's why we need the Reins Act. We should be passing these laws. We never passed one here in the House to do this. I wonder why we didn't. I wonder why the Senate didn't do it. It's because the American people don't want it. It's being pushed on them from an administrative branch, from bureaucrats that aren't <coughs> elected. You, you have no recourse. They do a, a notice, and then they take public comment, and they can ignore it, and they typically do. Part of the public comment they, they ignored here is the $250 million of, that they admit is the financial impact of this. This goes well beyond uh, a regulation of, let's say, some level of emissions, this carries with it criminal penalties. I mean, I know that some people in here think that the administrative branch should be able to determine amounts of uh, sulfur dioxide and things like that, and that we shouldn't be here. We'll let them tweak the knobs. But when they tweak the knobs so far on our laws that they create tens of millions of felons that can be punishable by 10 years, they've gone too far. And that's why we have support of Americans who don't even own one of these braces, may have never seen one of these braces. They don't care. They want a rule of law, not a rule of the, the executive branch. And that's why Mr. Clyde's uh, Congressional Review Act invocation is so important, and that's why we need to throw this rule out. And I yield back. Thank you very much. Gentleman from Colorado is recognized for any questions he may have for the panel. I thank the chairman. When historians 10 years, 20 years, 30 years from now attempt to explain how a country that is capable of such greatness was unable to muster the political will to do anything to combat the epidemic of gun violence in our communities, this hearing and the colloquy of the last 15 minutes will be a perfect microcosm. The question was raised as to whether or not this rule could prevent the loss of life. And clearly, folks in law enforcement have made the judgment that it could and that it will. From my perspective, it's a pretty easy conclusion to reach. Two years ago, in my community in Boulder, Colorado, as a gentleman from Kentucky well knows, a murderer walked into a grocery store and killed 10 members of my community. He was armed with an SB Tactical SBA-3 arm brace installed as standard equipment for the Ruger AR-555 pistol that he used. He killed 10 people, including one police officer, who died in the line of duty tragically, bravely making the ultimate sacrifice. I went to a lot of the funerals for the folks in my community two years ago. And for the life of me, I cannot understand the opposition that I've heard from some of my colleagues, the vast majority of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, to what is eminently a reasonable regulation to try to save lives and prevent what happened in my community from happening elsewhere. The gentleman spoke about other measures that the chairman, a former ranking member, or excuse me, former chairman, current ranking member, has led in the Judiciary Committee, and I serve on his committee and proud to serve with him on that committee. This measure is not those. There isn't a person in this room, I think, 
that would take issue with the fact that the underlying basis for this rule was developed not during the Biden administration, but during the Trump administration. Mr. Klein, I know you to be a straightforward member. Is that, am I wrong about that? That the underlying rule here was developed initially during the course of the Trump administration? That the rule was developed under the Trump administration to reverse the Obama administration's interpretation. No, incorrect. Mr. Klein, the underlying rule is based on guidance that was published under the Trump administration that concluded that stabilizing braces were widely used to create short-barreled rifles and therefore should be subject to stricter regulations. Now, as you will note, what I expected you to say was that yes, that is precisely what happened. And then in the closing days of the Trump administration, after a group of House Republicans I don't know if you were among them, implored the Trump administration to withdraw that guidance. The ATF withdrew it. Is that not the case? My understanding is that it was withdrawn uh, during the Trump administration. Of course, it was withdrawn, which meant it was yes. initiated by the Trump administration yes. and then withdrawn after political pressure. Thankfully, the Biden administration and the objective members of law enforcement in the ATF decided they would not bow to political pressure and promulgated a rule that is fair, that is reasonable, and that could save lives. Now, there's been a lot of talk. I mean, I, again, I, and I had hoped that my, my colleague from, uh, from Kentucky, whom I, I normally very much appreciate our colloquy, so I had hoped that he would be willing to yield to me a moment for a question as he was making this argument to the ranking member. Because as I understand the rule, no one in the state of Kentucky would be precluded from registering under this new rule were they to decide to do so. And under the rule, as the ATF has promulgated it, they wouldn't pay a dime, tax-free. Unless they're a felon, perhaps, in which case they, they would not necessarily pass the enhanced background check that will come from this new rule. But th this notion that somehow this now bans individuals from purchasing or owning a stabilizing brace is a fallacy. It requires you to register. It subjects the purchase to an enhanced background check. That's it, that's all we're talking about. And so I, I, I mean, ranking member, if you care to, uh, ranking member Nadler, expound a bit on this, but I, I I was just very confused by the, the give and take between you and Mr. Massey. Um, again, whom I respect, and, and I, I understand the conviction of his views, but I, I don't, that, that, let's have an intellectually honest debate about what this rule does and does not do. And frankly, the limits of the rule, the fact that it, it does not. I'm sure there are many who would like to see these braces banned completely, right? There might be folks who say, you shouldn't be able to purchase it. That's not what this rule does. And I just think it's important. We can land on different sides of, of the, the equation as far as the propriety of the ATF's decision in this regard. And as Mr. Massey said, obviously, it's the subject of some litigation now. But let's agree to talk about the rule under the language that has been promulgated by the ATF. Thank you, Member Nadler, if you care to respond. Well, I, I think you've laid it out uh, precisely. Um... I have nothing to add to it, really. You, you've said exactly that, exactly what, what the rule provides. Um, it does not require that anyone give up ownership of, of a brace. It just requires that they register under the circumstances you said. Well, I, I will simply, I agree with you, uh, ranking member, and uh, a lot I could say. I, I'll simply conclude by saying that I wish this committee and, and the broader house could be focused on addressing some of the consequential challenges that the American people face, certainly the people in my community face. Uh, and this rule is one of the ways in which this administration is attempting to do just that. I think this CRA is misguided. I think it's a waste of this body's time. Of course, 
Uh, we'll make those same arguments when we get to the floor to debate it. I'm not sure if we'll get to the floor to debate it. Obviously, as the American people know, watching this proceeding, we haven't voted in uh, five days, six days since last Tuesday. It'll be very interesting because it'll be a very group interesting of, to see whether the rule that was promulgated today. Sure, gets yeah. a group of House Republicans have essentially taken the House hostage. They've shut it down. There's there's no debate happening on the House floor. No bills being voted on right now. Except for suspension. Um, no suspension bills, of course, as you said. And I guess I suppose we'll do a couple uh, tonight. But from my vantage point, uh, it's a sad state of affairs here in the House. And uh, indeed, I'll conclude there. I'll yield back to the, uh, the, the chairman in abstentia here. Chair, thanks, the gentleman. Gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes. <coughs> Sorry, I have a few unanimous consent requests. The gentleman saves the request. Um, I have a letter that uh, Jim Jordan and uh, sent to, let's see, Jim Jordan and I sent this to uh, Steve Dettelbach, the ATF director. I'd like to submit that, asking him to clarify some of his statements. We've got the letter back from the ATF on that subject. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. And the chair recognizes Ms. Mitchell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for, uh, to the witnesses for testifying today. Um, Representative Klein, thanks for joining the Rules Committee uh, and uh, uh, Ranking Member Nadler. I'm an original co-sponsor of this legislation before us, so I'm not particularly undecided on the necessity of what we're doing. But having said that, in the process of reviewing the bill and learning more about pistol braces, I reviewed the written testimony of Amy Swearer, a senior legal fellow at the Heritage Foundation to a joint hearing of the House Oversight and Judiciary Committees in March of this year. Although I'm not a member of either of those committees, I think it's important for us to benefit from their work. In that testimony, Ms. Swearer highlighted the origin story of the pistol brace. We've heard some about, the, some about that uh, from um, my colleagues over here uh, today. That in 2012, a man named Alex Bosco invented it to help a friend who was a disabled veteran continue to shoot safely. I think that's one of the more compelling aspects of what we're talking about and why we're here today. Um, it, it's the impetus for this brace ATF has made illegal. It was designed to help our nation's veterans exercise their Second Amendment rights. Representative Klein, am I missing anything here? Is it an accurate statement that ATF is preventing veterans and other Americans who utilize these braces from safely exercising their Second Amendment rights? That's exactly correct. Is there anything in the ATF justification for this rule that takes into account these veteran and older American populations that would want to utilize these braces? Uh, not to my knowledge. Mr. Klein, does the Second Amendment to the United States Constitution exclude veterans? No. Does the Second Amendment exclude disabled adults? No. Does the Second Amendment say veterans or adults with disabilities are pro prohibited from owning and using handguns? It does not. Shouldn't both of these groups of law-abiding Americans have equal access to exercise their Second Amendment rights in a way they see best fits their needs? Absolutely. Does the Second Amendment require gun owners to register a weapon? No. Why should we be concerned with registries such as these for law-abiding citizens? I don't think they're appropriate for law-abiding citizens. Uh, do registries, um, is there a concern that registries of this type might lead to um, seizing of weapons. Uh, the ATF estimates there's 3 million of these in circulation that would need to be registered. Some estimates are much higher than that. Um, and, and one of the things that our colleague, uh, Mr. Nadler, said is if they're attached. So is, uh, Mr. Klein, if there are registries, is it in the realm of possibilities that ATF might vis visit a law-abiding citizen to determine whether or not a pistol brace is attached? It would most definitely be in the realm of possibility. And if a, a veteran is seen at a range with a, a pistol with a brace attached, uh, could be arrested by ATF currently because the grace period has ended and subject to a, a quarter of a million dollar fine and up to 10 years in federal prison. As I close, I just want to mention that I, vis I have visited businesses that supply these products, and they report that veterans and older Americans are among their primary customers. Uh, in my opinion, we should not be criminalizing these Americans, nor making it more difficult 
for them to exercise their constitutional right uh, in the Second Amendment. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentlelady yields back, Chair. Thanks, the gentlelady chair. Recognize the gentlelady from New Mexico. Thank you for the recognition. June, June, Gun Violence Month, June. And instead of addressing the scourge of gun violence, we are taking up a bill today to make sure that a deadly weapon, a weapon that can be made more deadly with the attachment <coughs> of these braces, continues to go under the radar, and basically we don't have the kind of background checks that are needed. And this is really kind of hard for me to be taking up this um, at this particular moment, because last Friday I was in my district in Farmington, New Mexico, where I met with the police officers, the victims, and neighbors who were terrified and wounded when an 18-year-old used an assault rifle and several other guns to kill three beautiful souls and several Police uh, and several others were injured, including two police officers. There were 144 bullets fired before he even left his front yard. One neighbor who <coughs> howled my shoulders as he explained how he will never forget the sound that an assault rifle makes as it tears through an engine and a car and the metal. And that the two women who were killed instantaneously because their bodies were not as hard as that car. That he felt that it was even worse for the woman who bled out on the street, his neighbor, who he tried to do something for but could not. There was nothing to be done. He asked for us to take action. Law enforcement have asked for us to take action. We have witnessed so many mass murders, whether mass killings, shootings. Sometimes it's been in the place of worship where people should gather and feel free to just pray to their gods and be grateful for the fact that they are in community with each other and not at risk because they are together. Where it should not be that you cannot go to a grocery store to shop because you are going to be at risk because there is a gathering of people. At schools, where children should not have to practice active shooter drills. But this one was slightly different because it was in your neighborhood. People feel that they should be safe in a quiet neighborhood. And they weren't, because he came out with all those weapons, and he fired them. And he dropped one and picked another one up and started firing that one, dropped that one, picked another one up and started firing that one. So we come back to this on a day where we've already had 290 mass shootings this year. Parents continue to be terrified when they drop their kids off. Americans aren't safe anywhere. While in Farmington, we discussed ways to strengthen protections, like not letting 18-year-olds buy, 18 buy military-style weapons. So you can imagine how hard it is to come back here and know we're not taking up the Raise the Age Act, which is actually bipartisan. Instead, we want to make sure that weapons that are more deadly than they are intended continue to be utilized without registration. This is what that's talking about. It's not saying you can't have them. It just says that you must go through the background checks, you must register them the same way you would register them if they were a rifle. Mr. Klein, do you agree that background checks are a useful thing? I believe that the uh, tragedies you spoke of are, are truly heinous acts and those who are responsible must be held accountable, and uh, that we must support our law enforcement. Do you believe, to, uh, keep do you believe that it's important to have background checks I so that, that felons do not get access? Those who are currently ineligible to purchase uh, firearms should not be able to purchase them, and that the uh, background check system that is in place should, be, uh, should operate effectively. Yes, Americans want to make sure that we have background checks. 
And the background checks are intended to make sure that those weapons that are more deadly are indeed registered and are subject to a higher level. And that's what this rule does. It says that, well, initially, initially it was an arm brace to assist a disabled veteran, but now that's not the case. Let me actually read you some of the language that is how these are being manufactured. Quote, it might look and function like a rifle, but thanks to the fact that AR-15 pistols don't come built with a stock, they're legally classified as pistols, giving them a full pardon from inconvenient NFA restrictions. <laughs> because isn't that the case, ranking member, that what we're doing, what, the, what they are doing here is simply looking to say, when we convert something from the pistol that was originally purchased to a more deadly rifle or short, short barreled gun, isn't that what we're trying to do, ranking member? It is. As, as Ms. Scanlon noted, we watched a video showing how these braces are being marketed. It's not being directed to disabled veterans. It's showing people how to use these braces to get around the longstanding rules about short barreled rifles. This rule just says, simply says, that if you're creating a short-barreled rifle, uh, they should be re regulated as such. Yeah, so all we're doing, and we're, not, we're saying what you should do if you have this, you, if you have the ability to use this pistol really like a rifle, then you should go through the same procedures people who have the rifles go through, right? Yes, with the appropriate background check. Right. Uh, and you know, it's interesting because in the Ohio, Dayton, Ohio shooting in 2019, the Dayton police chief, Richard Bale, said to have that level of weaponry in a, weaponry in a civilian environment, unregulated, it is problematic. It is problematic. This is law enforcement asking. And if you go through the rule, if you go through the proposed rule, which does take a lot of pages, it's about 95 pages, I will also say that it does point out that if you happen to have a pistol with a brace attached so you can shoot, shoot it from the shoulder, you do have the option. You have the option of deciding, I'm going to take these apart, get rid of the brace. I'm not going to have these anymore. And you know, but we have a lot of buyback uh, operations in New Mexico where gun owners themselves are tired of the carnage and are bringing in their weapons. And it says, just register. Now, uh, Chair Klein, if somebody owned a pistol with the kind of brace that turned it into the rifle, and they were a felon, wouldn't you want to know that? Well, I don't think that the possession of a piece of plastic should make you a felon. If you, if you have, wouldn't you want that person who is, might be a felon, not, it's not, owning the gun is not making you a felon. I'm saying if somebody was a felon and they were able to get, in essence, a, a, a powerful weapon, they, this would be a way, as the guy says up here, they'll get a full pardon. These are their words, the words that people are using. Rec ranking member, uh, I, I looked at the wool. Uh, they had picture after picture after picture that showed that what they are selling now does not look like the hand brace that was invented 10 years ago. Is that correct? It is correct. As I said before, the hand, the hand brace before was a forearm brace. Now we're talking about a shoulder brace. Yes, and they had picture and picture. The ATF had significant comment on this, and they have picture and picture of how these pistols are now no longer pistols. They are not being used. They are, they are now rifles. And all we're saying is since they are rifles, treat them as rifle. If it looks like a rifle, if it fires like a rifle, if it destroys like a rifle, have people go through the background checks and register it free of charge if you already have one. With that, Chairman, I yield back. That lady yields back, Chair. Thanks, the General Lady. Chair is prepared to yield to Chair yields to the uh, gentleman from New York, Mr. Langberg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Klein, for a person with a dis disability like the disabled veterans that the Braces Inventor sought to help back in 2012, what additional steps must someone like a veteran with a disability now contend with in order to exercise their Second Amendment rights? I thank the gentleman. Uh, this rule will require 
the owner of the roughly $40 million firearms, 40 million firearms with stabilizing braces to obtain a special registration, surrender or destroy their brace or face severe criminal penalties as a result of the regulatory change. Now, to your knowledge, has the ATF provided any evidence whatsoever to demonstrate that individuals with pistol braces have a higher likelihood of committing acts of violence? No. Have they provided any evidence whatsoever to show that out of the tens of millions of pistol brace users, that a significant proportion of that population are inclined to utilize such pistol braces in order to commit acts of violence? No, there is no evidence to indicate as much. Okay. So instead of focusing on mental health care, instead of focusing on hardening our schools or other public places, the Biden administration has once again chosen to attack law-abiding gun owners with an ambiguous rule that could be very broadly interpreted. Uh, what's even more appalling to me is that this administration is using tragedies like the mass shooting at a grocery store in Boulder, Colorado in 2021 for its own political purposes, all while punishing millions of law-abiding gun owners. I appreciate the work that the Judiciary Committee did to bring this resolution forward today. Uh, let's not let the Biden administration get away with any more measures that do nothing to get at the root causes of gun violence, but do everything to deny Americans their constitutional rights. I'm proud to be an original co-sponsor of this bill. Thank you, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks, the gentleman. Chair, now. Chair, now, it's happy to recognize the gentleman from Texas. I thank my, uh, my friend from Texas, the uh, chairman at the moment, and I'd yield to my friend from Kentucky for a minute. Of his thanks. Answer. I just want to uh, clear something up. Uh, this rule, I'll read this from the Federal Register. This revised definition reflects the department's understanding of the best interpretation of the statute, and it is immediately effective. In addition, because prior ATF classifications of firearms equipped with a brace device did not all employ this correct understanding of the statutory terms, all such prior classifications are no longer valid as of January 31st, 2023. So I want to submit this page out of the uh, Federal Register for the record. What it shows is the ATF is reversing themselves. They're not, it's not that the, defin, that the design of these things has changed or, or anything like that. It's not that they would allow you to have the original one that they certified as being legal, the original brace. It is, in fact, that they are changing their mind now, and they are revoking all of the prior guidance. And I uh, uh, ask unanimous consent to submit this one page to the, for the record. Without objection. So and I seen. yield back to Mr. Roy from Texas. Thank you. I think my friend from Kentucky, and it's a really good point. I know that earlier, and I'm sorry to step out to another meeting, uh, there, was, there was some conversation about, and I think it goes to the heart of this, you know, that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle will just dismiss and say that, you know, uh, no, you're not going to be felons. All you have to do is register. Well, what's the point of the registration? We know what the point of the registration is. But then beyond that, if only 250,000 of the some odd 40 million pistol braces uh, in the country have been registered, is it then okay then for the 37 point, you know, 39.75 million to be felons, right? We know what the purpose is. Right? It, and at the end of the day, we are making felons out of millions of Americans by virtue of the action that the president and his administration conducted unlawfully. That's the truth. Democrats have done this through the administration. They've done this. Congress could have acted. Congress did not act. Congress did not do this despite passing legislation last summer. That's the truth. The fact is it was the executive branch who did it unilaterally. Now, some have then said, oh, well, but this is going back to the, the previous administration this rule started. Well, the previous administration also did the bump stock, which was summarily uh, kicked aside by the Fifth Circuit. Now, they did that because, of course, they did. And look, I am an equal opportunity basher of the executive branch. I don't care who's in char charge of it, Republican or Democrat. I'm an equal opportunity basher of Congress. Don't care who's in the majority, Democrats or Republicans. We spend too much. We do too little. We don't do a damn thing that actually makes lives better for the American people. We make things worse collectively as a body. And the executive branch oversteps its bounds, abuses its authority, and this body does nothing to stop it. That's the truth. The executive branch has been doing it for years. They've been doing it on issue after issue after issue, and we don't do a thing about it. And it's embarrassing. It's absolutely embarrassing.
that the United States Congress will not hold the executive branch to account. Yet here we are, trying to do the one thing we could do to hold the executive branch to account. That even if I spot my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, that this rule is necessary. I've heard a lot of issues about the policy. Even if I spot that, which I do not, the reality is it should be done by Congress. It should not be done unilaterally, unlawfully, unconstitutionally by a renegade executive branch. I believe it will be struck down by the courts. I believe it will be struck down by the courts properly. But it is our duty in Congress to defend the Constitution, separation of powers, and the right way for law to be made. And that is not by unelected bureaucrats. The fact of the matter is, if you look at the reality of, of how this all came about and the truth, the rule identifies no founding era precedent of regulating weapons based on barrel length, much less regulating handguns more stringently merely because the possessor happens to attach accessories to the weapon designed to increase ergonomics and accuracy. This being from litigation filed by the state of Texas. Heller, for example, talking about common use. Stabilizing braces meet that definition as they are in widespread use by millions of Americans for lawful purposes. ATF itself estimates on the low end that there are three million stabilizing braces currently in circulation. We believe that number is much larger. Finally, the rule, uh, the final rule regulates handguns, an indisputably protected weapon under the Second Amendment of the United States Constitution. Moreover, ATF's regulation extends into the home. A person who possesses a handgun and a stabilizing brace, even if not attached, is a felon unless he registers the combination as a rifle under the NFA. Um, I would just wonder if my friend from Virginia, a learned lawyer, um, I know you've covered some of this, and I'm sorry I stepped out, but just if there's anything else you want to clarify about the absurdity of the abuse of the executive branch's power here <coughs> to carry out policymaking <coughs> by executive fiat rather than deferring to Congress and, and, the, and the rightful place for Congress to act here regardless of the policy. Only that I would concur with the gentleman and that this is a, a debate about the exercise of uh, Article I powers of Congress. This is not... There is a debate about the policy going on here, but this is where it should happen, not uh, within the ATF, not about whether to issue a regulation. The debate about the policy should happen in this body, uh, and the debate that is occurring today is about who should best uh, make policy, and it should reside with Congress, and that's why we should pass this, uh, this resolution. And I appreciate the gentleman. I would remind people that if, and this may have already been discussed, and it might have been discussed by my friend from Kentucky, that it was the, in fact, Obama ATF, right, in 2012. Uh, it was Marine Army veteran Alex Bosco who invented the pistol stabilizing brace to help his friend, a disabled combat veteran, at the shooting range, right? That's the fact. That's how it came about. Subsequently, the ATF advised Mr. Bosco's company, SB Tactical, that its stabilizing brace did not convert a pistol into a short barrel rifle. That was the ATF a decade ago. Keep in mind, that was the Obama administration's ATF. This means ATF had considered pistol braces legal for about a decade. And it is because the administration, the current administration, talk about extreme, an administration that is being controlled by the most radical left elements of the Democratic Party that are running the White House and in the absence of a commander in chief who's barely present in it, physically or cognitively. And you've got a bunch of people running around representing the radical left who are making up policies as they go going and finding what they could find from the latest study group from some you know, Ivy League uh, group that sits and meets and pontificates about such things. And now you've got millions of Americans who are felons, millions of Americans who have a weapon, felons. And, and, and the reaction from the ranking member of the House Judiciary Committee is, oh, just separate the plastic. Why? Well, first of all, that's unclear from the rule, although the, my friend from Kentucky had a great exchange with the director of the ATF in which he acknowledged that if you separate the piece of plastic uh, from the weapon that you would be okay. Uh, that will have to be borne out. But that's the, that's the, that's the uh, reaction by my friends from the left to just say, oh, we'll just separate this piece of plastic. You won't be a felon. You've got millions of Americans who have not done that, who, don't, who aren't aware of the rule, who have not been advised of the rule, and suddenly they're going to be felons, punishable up to 10 years in prison and tens of thousands of dollars in fines. I think the gentleman from Kentucky would like to jump in. Yeah, we, we contacted the ATF, and they wrote us back and they basically said that Mr. Dettelbach's statement was not correct, mm. it, even though uh, Mr. Nadler repeated Mr. Dettelbach's advisement that all he had to do was separate it. 
I think we've kind of litigated that here, hopefully, and, and people know that neither the ranking member of judiciary nor the ATF director understood the rule when they gave that advisement. And so I would assume that my friend from Virginia would agree with me that that therefore means that there are millions of Americans who don't have the damnedest clue whether or not they're in fact a felon if they take the said piece of plastic, which was banned by an administration through executive fiat without congressional uh, concurrence, and whether or not it is attached to their weapon or not, they may well in fact be a felon. That's absolutely true, and uh, there's a uh, difference of opinion as to whether once this piece of plastic is separated from the weapon, it can, it, that you are uh, within the law to keep it separate without somehow making it, uh, destroying the piece of plastic or making it impossible to reattach it. And, and we don't have that clear instruction at this point. So effectively, we're waiting on the United States Supreme Court to ultimately decide and save Americans from the possibility of being felons or paying massive fines. Correct. Because Congress refuses to act unless we pass the Congressional Review Act and the Senate was to pass the Congressional Review Act to send it to the president and the president were to sign it. Correct. So the last point I'll simply make is this. Um, we've had, I mean, hundreds of examples of this administration overstepping its bound, whether it was student loans, which we've discussed in here, which is CRA was passed, the Senate passed it, and then the president vetoed it. Imagine it was passed on a bipartisan basis in the Senate. The president vetoed it. Uh, the reality is we've been able to get a couple of things done to try to fix the mess that the administration is making on a daily basis, passing uh, all sorts of rules through executive fiat. The fact is they're doing it across the board. They're doing it no notably, I'll close on this, they're doing it notably with respect to the border, making all manners of decisions through the executive branch in direct violation of the law led by the president and Secretary Marcus himself, and we had a federal judge just rule last week in the Northern District of Texas saying, and I quote, defendants, illegal aliens pleaded guilty to conspiracy to transport and harbor illegal aliens. The sentencing information shows that on behalf of the Juarez cartel, defendants participated in an alien smuggling conspiracy. Their participation included operating an illegal alien stash house in Fort Worth, Texas, and transporting those who had been smuggled into the United States. The smuggling organization charged 10,000 to smuggle an adult illegal alien to the United States and between 12 to 14,000 to smuggle a child illegal alien. The fact is law enforcement discovered this. The Fort Worth portion of this smuggling operation after a man in Baltimore, the husband, paid the organization to have his wife and two-year-old daughter smuggled into the United States after they arrived in Mexico from Honduras. The husband contends he paid the smuggling organization $1,000 to smuggle his wife and child. They were then transported to the stash house where the husband contends a member of the smuggling organization demanded he pay an additional $23,000 before his family would be released. The member also told the husband, quote, they would do things to his daughter he would not like if he did not make this payment. It goes on and on and on to say, and they close, the judge, the guidelines do not adequately take into account these facts when recommending an appropriate prison range, and accordingly, the parties are provided notice the court intends to vary upward from the applicable guidelines range so they may address this at the time of sentencing. After one of the guys pled to two years, and after another guy was in the range looking at a sentencing in between uh, 51 and 63 months, for moving children, unaccompanied alien children, for profit in the United States of America, while our administration does nothing but violate the law, ignore their responsibility under the Secure Fence Act to maintain operational control of the border, they're doing it wantonly. The uh, Secretary of Homeland Security should be impeached for it. The President, frankly, should be impeached for it. And everything that he is doing and engaging in lawlessness through the executive overreach is something that this body should be doing something about, and that is why we should pass this as one step of many. I yield back. The gentleman yields back, Chair. Thanks, the gentleman. Chair recognizes the gentleman from South Carolina. I'll, I'll be brief. Sorry, I had to step out. Uh, this is just another weaponization that this president, this administration is doing to uh, put people on, take a Second Amendment rights first, and then um, to basically ignore all the other problems, as Chip says. I, I, I have not heard one thing from the other side about the remorse about the thousands that are being killed, the 100,000 young adults that got killed are being killed for fentanyl coming across. The, my friends from the other side are ignoring that. What's happened, uh, you keep saying gun violence, it's people violence. Uh, and it's horrible what our, we've lost our children in these schools, but uh, you know, you don't say airplane violence, that 
calls 911, you don't say uh, car violence, that the maniac that went through the Christmas parade. So this bill here is just another attempt to take away our Second Amendment rights. And, you know, it's amazing that it's been, uh, we're having this much debate on this. It shouldn't even have been a debate. But uh, it's a great bill. I'm looking forward to voting for it. And, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back, Chair. Thanks, gentlemen. Are there any other questions for this panel? Seeing none, I thank the witnesses for their testimony, and they are excused. Is there anyone else seeking to testify on H.J. Res. 44? Seeing none, this closes the hearing portion. Without objection, the committee stands in recess, subject to the call of the chair. <laughs>